1. Annie Rawson, formerly Annie Hinkle, shifted the bag of groceries to her good hip, the one that hadn't been replaced with steel metal rod, to dig around in her purse for her house keys. It was only when she got closer to the front door of the cabin, that she saw the threat spray painted in a bright garish red across the glossy oak surface. Leave or die. A surge of bile rose in her throat, and she glanced fearfully over her shoulder. The small house was nestled in the woods about 100 feet from the road. Whoever left the threat could be anywhere. But who? And why? Her ex-husband Kurt was dead. Her now almost 22-year-old son Tommy was locked up in prison. Who else could hate her that badly? Instinctively, she retreated to her car, sliding in behind the wheel and then locking herself inside, hating the way her hands had begun to shake with fear. She took several deep breaths in an attempt to settle her racing heart. She was stronger now, wasn't she? A different woman than had left Crystal Lake on a stretcher three years ago after her abusive husband had run her over with his truck. Like Humpty Dumpty, it had taken all the nurses and doctors at the trauma center in Madison, Wisconsin, to put her back together again. Once she'd recovered, she'd attended a health unit coordinator training program and began working part-time. And while she was grateful for the hospital staff in Madison that had saved her life, Annie hadn't liked living and working there. Madison was too big, too busy, and too impersonal. Full of college students that made her feel way older than her 39 years. Returning to Crystal Lake and the house that she'd once shared with her husband had seemed like a good idea at the time. Now looking at the words written with hate and loathing across her front door, she knew she'd underestimated the impact of the past. When she was certain she could speak without breaking down, she pulled out her cell phone and called the Hope County Sheriff's Department. A flash of anger quickly replaced her fear. She hadn't done anything to deserve being a victim of vandalism. To be subjected to a death threat. Sheriff's Department, what's your emergency? Annie didn't recognize the dispatcher's voice, then again she'd never called the police while she'd lived here. Just one of her many mistakes. This is Annie Rawson. Someone has vandalized my home. Rawson! The dispatcher's confusion was obvious so Annie quickly explained. The address is 2121 County Road ZZ, located north of the lake. The old Hinkle place? I know where it is. I'll send a deputy right over. Annie disconnected from the call, wondering with a weary sigh if she'd be known as Annie Hinkle forever. Taking her maiden name had been just one of the ways she'd tried to move beyond her past. Getting a job and being independent had helped too. But the most helpful of all was finding faith in God. Sending up a simple prayer for safety helped ease the tightness in her chest. Feeling better, she unlocked the vehicle and slid out from behind the wheel. She set the groceries on the hood. Leaning against the car favoring her right hip, she glanced up at the sunny sky. The May weather was warm, and there was a small carton of cookie dough ice cream at the bottom of her grocery bag that she didn't want to melt. Stupid Vandal would owe her a new door and a new half gallon of ice cream. The sound of tires crunching on gravel had her straightening and turning to face the newcomer. Just seeing the brown car with the Hope County Sheriff logo stenciled across the side made her feel sick to her stomach. Ridiculous reaction, it wasn't as if she had anything to hide. At least, not anymore. Still, she crossed her arms protectively over her chest and tried to smile. The officer who slid out from behind the wheel wasn't very tall, maybe only 5 feet 10 inches, and had dark hair cut short. She vaguely remembered seeing him around when she'd lived here before. He looked young, but these days everyone did, and she figured it was because she'd already lived one lifetime and was on her second time around. Good evening, Ms. Rawson. I'm Deputy Jason Thomas. She liked the fact that he called her by her real name, then flushed realizing he probably had run some sort of background check on her. No doubt he'd know all about her husband and son. Thanks for coming. I need to report an act of vandalism. It's over there. She waved her hand toward the front door. Deputy Thomas walked closer to the door and frowned as he read the message. After a moment, he returned to where she waited. Do you have any idea who may have some sort of grudge against you? Me? 
No. There were plenty of people who may have been upset with her husband or her son, but she hadn't done anything. Hadn't socialized much either. Hard to make friends when you were constantly living in fear and covering up bruises. I haven't been back here long, less than a week. And you just came home now from the grocery store. He'd obviously taken note of the bag sitting on the hood and her casual dress, threadbare jeans and a blue blouse that she'd been told matched her eyes. Yes, but I haven't been here since early this morning. I worked from 7 to 3.30. I have a job at Hope County Hospital as a health unit coordinator for the emergency department. For a moment the image of the little girl, barely three years old who'd been brought in with a small laceration on her forehead from falling in the woods, flashed in her mind. The child's mother had acted funny, but had been fiercely protective of the little girl, so abuse hadn't been suspected. Would she always see abuse behind every injury? Maybe. Congrats on the new job, he said with a smile, then he turned to look at the door again. So this could have happened at any time today. Hum. Stay here. I'll take a look around. Thank you. Some of the tension eased from her shoulders as the deputy moved away, scanning the ground covered with twigs and other debris from the trees. Her plan had been to try to fix the place up to sell it, since the idea of living here wasn't very appealing. Although once she'd arrived, she discovered she liked living in the woods. She enjoyed seeing the occasional white-tailed deer and wild turkeys coming right up to her back door. Maybe she should reconsider, the house was paid off and staying would be cheaper than renting a place. She needed to save up some money now that her hospital bills were finally paid off. Decisions, decisions. Even after three years of being on her own, making these types of plans didn't come easy. She was constantly second-guessing herself. Deputy Thomas disappeared around the corner of the house, and for a moment she wanted to call him back. It didn't take long for him to complete the circle, coming around from the other side. I'll dust for prints and take some photographs for our files, but unfortunately I haven't found anything else that might be useful. He looked truly apologetic, and she appreciated his concern. At least he wasn't blowing her off. That's fine, I understand. She hoped her smile portrayed more confidence than she actually felt. He returned to his squad, then went back to the door. She waited, imaging her ice cream melting into a puddle of lumpy syrup. Surprisingly, the task of checking for fingerprints didn't take long. There were a few prints around the door handle, some of which likely belong to you. I hope you don't mind coming over to the department so we can get yours on file to eliminate them. Her smile faltered. You mean right now? He reached over and picked up her grocery bag. It would be best since I'm almost finished with my shift. Once we have what we need from you, I'll be able to work on this case first thing tomorrow. Let's put your things away before we go. The thought of inviting this stranger, this cop, into her house filled her with dread. Reminding herself she had nothing to hide, she quickly hurried ahead to unlock the door. A fine layer of fingerprint dust covered the door and the handle, but she ignored it, there'd be time to clean it up, later. Even with the bag in his arms, he used his elbow to hold the door open for her. After you. Weird the way Deputy Thomas was being so nice to her. She wasn't used to gentlemen with manners. Sweeping her gaze over the interior of the cabin, she tried seeing it through his eyes. It was small and sparse but exceptionally clean. The one thing she couldn't seem to get over in the three years since her husband's death was the obsessive compulsive need to keep everything spotless. She led the way into the kitchen and gestured to the old once white but now yellowed formica counter. Please set it there thanks. Deputy Thomas stepped aside and she swiftly put things away, including the ice cream, relieved it wasn't too soft and squishy. As she moved around the kitchen, she was keenly aware of the deputy's eyes following her. Why he was standing in her home at all was confusing. Was it that he didn't trust her to actually go in to be fingerprinted? He had to know about her past, which made her wonder if he assumed the worst about her because of the not-so-favorable reputation of her deceased husband and her troublemaker son. Slamming the door on those painful memories, she shook off the sense of forbidding and finished up what she was doing. Then she turned and picked up her purse. 
Okay, I'm ready. Nice place, Deputy Thomas said as they walked back through the living room to the front door. Cozy, rustic, but tidy. Was he being facetious? Or was she being ultra-sensitive? Her therapist, Dr. Anderson, had assured her she was well on her way to healing, and that everything she did was a step in the right direction for moving on with her life. But sometimes Annie wasn't so sure the confidence she portrayed wasn't anything but an act. No, she was making progress. Those seeds of self-doubt had been planted by Kurt. She was determined to remain strong and independent. And just that quickly, her decision was made. She wouldn't live in Kurt's house any longer than she had to. I'm planning to list it on the market as soon as possible, she said. Shouldn't be too hard to sell the place, especially during the tourist season. He held the door for her again, the woodsy scent of his aftershave teasing her senses. The visceral response caught her completely off guard, so that she stumbled, putting too much of her weight on her newly created right hip. She felt herself falling, but strong arms caught her before she could unceremoniously hit the ground. Are you all right? Deputy Thomas's deep husky voice tickled her ear as he set her back on her feet. Yes? Did that breathless sound really come from her? Come on, Annie, pull yourself together. Yes, she repeated in a stronger voice. She pulled away from him, feeling her cheeks flush with embarrassment. What was wrong with her? Deputy Thomas had to be ten years her junior for heaven's sake, even if she was looking for a man which she absolutely was not. Thank you. Sorry about that, I'm a bit clumsy. Not at all, you stepped on a pinecone sea. He lightly kicked the offending object away. How about I give you a ride to headquarters? That way I can make sure you get home safely. Okay, maybe he was the crazy one, because if she was younger, prettier and hadn't been stupid enough to stay married to the town's most abusive drunk, she might have thought he was expressing some sort of interest in her. But of course, that was ludicrous. No thank you, I'd rather have my own transportation. All right. He opened her car door for the third time in the past 30 minutes, which was a record since no one had ever done that for her before, and waited for her to slide in behind the wheel before he made his way to his squad. Alone in the car she let out her breath in a relieved whoosh. This insane awareness of the deputy had to stop right now. All she wanted was to live a quiet and peaceful life. No way in the world did she intend to be dependent on a man for anything, ever again. With that settled, she turned on the car and backed out of the driveway, following Deputy Thomas's car all the way down to Crystal Lake's Main Street. She pulled in and parked in the lot of the Sheriff's Department headquarters, then followed Deputy Thomas inside. The building didn't look nearly as intimidating as she'd imagined. He'd introduced her to April Manning, the young dispatcher who'd answered the phone when she'd called, then led her to the fingerprint area. Pressing her fingertips into the ink and rolling them on the pad made her feel as if she was the one who'd done something wrong. Granted, she'd made plenty of mistakes, the main one included getting pregnant and marrying Kurt Hinkle the day she turned 18, but she'd never broken the law. Here, use this to wipe off your hands, Deputy Thomas said, handing her a wet wipe. Thanks. The ink didn't come all the way off, and she knew that once she returned home she'd end up scrubbing at them until they were perfectly clean. After tossing the wipe aside, she glanced up at his deep green eyes. So. Um. You'll let me know if you find out anything, right? Absolutely. He escorted her back outside. Would you like to grab something to eat at Rose's Cafe? She blinked and somehow managed not to gape at him. Excuse me? Dinner. It's late and I'm hungry. You must be too. My treat. Was he asking her out on a date? No, that wasn't possible. I think it's best if I get home, she said, even though the idea of eating at the cafe sounded good. Her dinner at home would be nothing more than canned soup, she'd only picked up enough fresh food to make lunches for work, since the cafeteria was expensive, and she wouldn't get her first paycheck for another 10 days. But thanks for asking. You're going to make me eat alone, huh? His smile was rueful, and harder to resist than it should have been. Your choice, but just remember that you always have a friend in the sheriff's department. Why? 
The question popped out of her mouth before she could stop it. Normally she wasn't this bold, but she really didn't understand what was going on. Why would you want to be my friend? Because I know what you went through years ago, and I admire you for coming back here. That took a lot of inner strength and courage. Her cheeks burned with mortification at the thought of him knowing what she'd lived through. Yet he couldn't possibly know everything. No one in Crystal Lake knew the depth and breadth of what she'd endured for years at her husband's hands. A doctor and nurse in the Ur had suspected, but hadn't known for sure. No one had. Especially not the authorities. Because she hadn't told a single soul, other than Dr. Anderson, any of the gory details. And she wasn't about to start, now. 2. Jason Thomas watched Annie's face go pale, and mentally kicked himself for pushing so hard. Yeah, patience wasn't his strong suit, but still, he should have let her go home without the dinner invitation. Idiot. He lifted his hands, palms facing forward. Hey, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to upset you by bringing up the past. It's fine, really. I just thought you were probably hungry, too. No big deal. She slowly shook her head and grimaced. It's not that. I just don't have many friends. Remembering the death threat sprawled across her front door, he thought it was a shame that the citizens of Crystal Lake hadn't been more welcoming. After all, Annie was one of their own. At least, as far as he knew, she'd been living here when he'd come back out of college to start working with the sheriff's department, what 15 years ago. He held out his hand and it seemed forever before she placed her slender one in his. Her fingers were cold and he tried for a light tone. Hi. My name is Jason, it's nice to meet you Annie. She blushed and solemnly shook his hand. Nice to meet you too. There, see how easy that was? He let go of her fingers, even though he didn't necessarily want to. Now we're friends. She rolled her eyes. It's not that simple. Sure it is. He wanted to repeat his offer to have dinner at Rose's cafe, but figured he should back off. He released her hand. Hope to see you around, Annie. She hesitated, then nodded. Sure. He turned and began walking toward the cafe, which wasn't too far from headquarters, when suddenly she called out his name. Deputy Er Jason? He stopped and spun toward her. Yes? I wouldn't mind sharing dinner in a friendly sort of way. He grinned. Great, I'm glad to hear it. Do you mind walking? Of course not. As she approached, he could see that her cheeks were flushed. The color looked good on her, much better than her previous pallor. For a long minute, neither of them spoke. It's almost tourist season, guess that means you'll be extra busy, huh? She said, breaking the silence. It won't be too bad, he replied with a shrug. Things don't get too crazy until the 4th of July holiday. I can imagine. The tourists bring a lot of money into this town so there's no point in resenting the deluge of visitors. He sent her a wry look. Not even those coming up from Illinois. We Wisconsinites have to get over it. I guess you're right. She sounded contrite, as if she'd said something wrong, and he gave himself another mental head slap. The last thing he wanted was to make her feel as if he'd been criticizing her. Well, I'm sure it's a little different from the hospital perspective he said reaching for the door leading inside Rose's cafe. I bet the ur gets busy. She nodded, then preceded him inside. Josie, the cafe owner, immediately waved them over. I have a booth right here, just give me a minute to clear it off. Thanks Josie. The food was great and the owner was nice enough, even if she was the biggest gossip in town. Annie crossed her arms over her chest, looking distinctly uncomfortable. He'd noticed she'd done the same thing when he'd first arrived at the house. Good to see you, Annie, Josie said, her gaze bouncing curiously between the two of them like a ping-pong ball. I didn't realize you were back. He lifted a brow. She's been here for almost a week already, your grapevine must be running behind. Josie didn't take offense, in fact, he suspected she liked being the center of all the latest news. Oh, you. She lightly swatted at him with her dish towel. Go on now. I'm not that bad. 
except she was, and everyone knew it. He smiled when he noticed the flash of amusement in Annie's blue eyes. There, have a seat. Josie stepped back, tucking the dish towel into the waistband of her apron. I'll get you a couple of menus. He had the cafe menu memorized, but doubted that Annie did. He waited for her to slide in first, before taking the seat across from her. Here you go. Josie slid the plastic menus in front of them. Then she pulled out her pencil and notepad. They didn't do anything high-tech around here. Can I get you something to drink? I'll have some of your famous raspberry lemonade. He glanced at Annie. What would you like? I'll have the same. The gleam in Josie's eyes grew brighter, as if she'd caught the scent of new gossip. Great, I'll be right back. After she left them alone, Annie folded her arms on the table and leaned forward as if sharing a big secret. Josie thinks there's something more going on between us than simple friendship, she said in a loud whisper. He laughed and was relieved when Annie joined in. I guess I should have warned you about her. I've heard the stories, just never really saw her in action. She wiggled her eyebrows. Impressive. He chuckled again. Yeah, I guess that's one word for it. Unbelievable is another. You'd better let your family and your girlfriend know, Annie added. Before they see the news plastered all over the front newspaper. No girlfriend, he said, his smile turning strained. He'd only been in one serious relationship, and Darla had left him after she'd learned the truth about his inability to father a child. That alone wouldn't have been so bad, but she'd gone on to marry a controlling, verbally abusive guy that they'd all gone to school with. Christopher was the former high school football star with a mean streak. When Jason learned Darla had died of a concussion, falling down the basement stairs, he'd often wondered if Christopher's verbal abuse had turned physical. And my parents recently moved to Arizona, where they are extremely happy they don't have to deal with snow. I don't mind the snow, Annie said, changing the subject. It's not much fun to drive in, but I love the way it clings to the pine trees, so pretty. He was secretly amazed at how well she seemed to be doing, after everything she'd been through at the hands of her husband. Like a flower that had been transplanted from a small, stifling container to a large and spacious garden. He was glad she appeared to be thriving. Annie peered down at her menu. What's good here? Everything is pretty good, but my favorite is their burger. Josie returned, setting their raspberry lemonades down on the table along with two straws. Are you ready to order? He glanced at Annie, who nodded. Sure, I'll have the grilled chicken sandwich. A burger for me. Medium rare with extra pickles and no onions, right? It was his turn to feel embarrassed. I'm that predictable, huh? Only because you're in here at least three times a week, Josie said with a wink. What you need is a good woman to cook for you once in a while, right Annie? Annie sputtered nearly spitting out a mouthful of raspberry lemonade. W.H. what? she asked between coughs. You know the real way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Josie grinned again before she spun away, swinging her generous hips. Ignore her, he told Annie. She can't help herself. Annie nodded and coughed some more. Then she took another long sip. I'm not so sure this was a good idea. Hey, it's fine. We're friends, remember? It's nice to share a meal with someone, rather than eating alone. She tilted her head to the side. Why would you end up eating alone? I'm sure there are a variety of young single women around, who would be more than happy to keep you company. He shrugged. Most of them want the one thing I can't give to them. At her confused expression, he quickly clarified. Children. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I didn't know. Jason figured she had to be one of the few who didn't. After all, when Darla left him, she hadn't been quiet about the reasons why. She'd felt cheated that he hadn't told her right up front, so he'd learned to put the truth out there right from the beginning. Not that he and Annie would have any sort of relationship. Sure he liked and admired her, but he'd given up any thoughts about getting married and having a family of his own, a long time ago. Besides, he wasn't so sure Annie was in the market for a man either. Which was why being friends was so perfect. 
Rare case of the mumps when I was 13, he said before she could ask. Yes, I was immunized. No, the doctors couldn't figure out why the immunization didn't work. Just one of those freak things. I'm sorry. She reached out to lightly touch his arm, and he resisted the urge to cover her fingers with his. But there are plenty of other options, any woman who doesn't see that, doesn't deserve you. Thanks. He tried not to let her see how much her comment meant to him. But I'm okay with my life just the way it is. As soon as the words left his mouth, he knew they weren't exactly true. Lately he'd felt as if something was missing. Something he couldn't quite pinpoint. Not loneliness exactly but something nebulous. Of course you are. It's not for us to question God's plan. He was a bit taken aback by her statement. I'm not sure God cares about whether or not I father children someday. The light in her blue eyes dimmed a bit. You don't believe in God's plan? I do. Everything happens for a reason, so I'm sure God has something else in mind for you. Josie returned with their meal saving him from formulating some sort of response. Do you need anything else? She asked as they unwrapped their silverware. Nope, looks good as usual. Thanks, he said. Josie winked at him before turning to leave. He picked up his knife, then belatedly realized Annie had clasped her hands together and bowed her head. He sat awkwardly waiting for her to finish her murmured prayer before digging into his meal. The fact that Annie had faith in God was a bit humbling. Did she really think that she'd suffered abuse, almost dying at her husband's hands for a reason? That God had put her into harm's way on purpose? Nope. He wasn't buying that. It was his turn to change the subject. Tell me about your new job. Her eyes lit up again. It's great. I like working in the hospital. Even though I'm not directly caring for patients, at least I'm supporting those who do. We see all kinds of patients from elderly men and women to young kids. It's so interesting. I really wanted to be a nursing assistant, but after my hip surgery, my doctor suggested a career that's less physically challenging. Remembering the way she'd stumbled and nearly fallen over the pinecone made him frown. Shouldn't you use a cane or something? She narrowed her gaze and lifted her chin defiantly. I'm 41, not 61. I don't need a cane. Hey, I was only thinking of your health and welfare, he pointed out. I'm 38 and there are more days that I care to admit that I feel closer to 68. You're 38. She looked surprised. I thought you were a lot younger. He lifted his glass of raspberry lemonade as a toast. I could say the same thing about you. She smiled and lifted her glass tapping it lightly against his. To the roaring 30s and in my case, 40s. He burst out laughing thinking that it had been a long time since he'd enjoyed himself like this. Especially with a woman. I have to admit, I didn't think this was a good idea but I'm enjoying it, Annie said. Up to now, I've always avoided the police, but you're making me realize how ridiculous that is. You've had experience with bad cops, he asked with a frown. She shrugged and avoided his gaze. Not personally, but obviously my husband and son were well known by the sheriff's deputies here in town. I often felt guilty by association. She took another sip of her lemonade. I didn't learn about Kurt's death, being shot and killed by one of the deputies here, until after a series of reconstructive surgeries. I don't remember much about what they said, at the time I was focused on staying alive. He felt as if she'd punched him in the gut. Her husband. Kurt Hinkle. It never occurred to him that Annie didn't know the truth. That he was one of the deputies called to the hospital in response to the 911 call regarding Kurt Hinkle being in the ER, waving a gun, and threatening to kill Nurse Larissa and a doctor by the name of Gabe Allen, because they tried to help Annie. The standoff had seemed to go on forever, Larissa trying to talk to Kurt, imploring him to stop, but when he'd raised his gun and fired, Jason had shot him hitting Hinkle in the chest and taking him down. Larissa and Gabe Allen, who were now married, had rushed over to provide emergency care to Hinkle, despite the fact that he'd attempted to kill them. Jason sat for a moment struggling to breathe. He hadn't aimed to kill that day, 
but that hadn't changed the fact that Kurt Hinkle had suffered one complication and then another from his gunshot wound to the chest. And had ultimately died because of it. Because of him. Annie might not mourn her ex-husband after the guy had run her over with his truck, but she had found faith in God. She'd also come back to start over. How would she feel once she learned the truth? He'd killed her husband. Making him a constant reminder of the life she'd worked so hard to forget. 3. Annie watched Jason withdraw into himself, as if her comment about avoiding the police had bothered him. Or maybe it was just that he didn't appreciate being reminded of the fact that one of his fellow officers had assisted in ending Kurt's life. Between her counselor and Pastor John who ran the Crystal Lake Church, she'd managed to find a semblance of peace. It wasn't easy, there were times she still felt guilty about her inability to mourn her husband's passing. She'd lived with the man for 20 years, surely she should feel some sense of loss. But she didn't. Pastor John didn't think less of her, in fact he'd recently pointed out how Kurt had tried to kill her and in doing so, had destroyed whatever feelings she once had for him. Which was exactly what her therapist, Dr. Anderson, had said. Kurt hadn't always been a terrible man. At first they'd been happy together, for maybe the first few years. Then he'd started drinking, and accusing her of not loving him enough. From there, the accusation somehow became turned against her. He'd ranted and raved about how she wasn't worthy of his love or his respect. That she deserved to be hit or kicked because the house wasn't clean enough, or her meals weren't good enough. That she was a terrible mother and a worse wife. Looking back, she couldn't understand how she could have been so foolish as to believe him. Kurt had turned into a classic abuser, and the worst part was that she hadn't sought help until it was almost too late. I've learned a lot about forgiveness in the past few years, she said, hoping to make him feel better. Finding God and faith has helped me more than I can say. I'm happy for you, he said in a low, gravely voice. She caught his gaze, wondering why he looked so closed down. You might want to give it a try, she suggested. It probably sounds hokey, but attending church services can be incredibly soothing. I'm planning to go this weekend, and you're welcome to join me. I sure, I guess that would be okay. He didn't sound very enthusiastic or bother to ask what time services were, so she decided to let it go for now. Maybe he'd come and maybe he wouldn't, that was a journey he needed to figure out for himself. No one could do it for him. She finished half of her chicken sandwich and the accompanying french fries, then decided to save the rest for her dinner tomorrow night. Frugal? Yes, but Jason didn't need to know the details of her rather dismal financial situation. Lifting her glass of raspberry lemonade, she took a sip just as a guy walked past her, roughly jostling her arm almost on purpose. The rim of her cup smacked into her mouth hard enough to hurt, as pink liquid splashed over her face and down onto the front of her blouse. Hey watch it, Jason said in a sharp tone. The guy didn't bother looking back, but swiftly pushed through the door and disappeared outside. It's okay. She picked up her napkin and blotted the dampness from her face and blouse. I'm sure it was an accident. At least she hoped so. No sense in making drama where there wasn't any. This wasn't the time to become paranoid. Yeah, maybe. Jason scowled through the window following the guy as he strode away. Do you know him? Me? No. She didn't want to point out that she didn't know many people in town, either by name or face. All those years she'd lived here she'd rarely left the house except to grocery shop, and even then, she'd never looked people in the eye. A prison of her own making, she realized now. How pathetic had she been to allow Kurt control her life to that extent? She squared her shoulders. No more. The only thing in control of her life was her own choices and God's plan. I didn't get a good glimpse of his face either, Jason said, his expression thoughtful. But I'm sure Josie probably knows him. Before she could protest, Jason stood and walked over to the lawn counter. Josie? Do you have a minute? Sure hon, what can I get you? Who was that guy who just left? Salt and pepper hair, medium height and build, dressed in a ratty black t-shirt and blue jeans? Josie wrinkled her forehead for a moment then snapped her fingers. 
Oh, that was Pete Landry. You know, he's one of the co-owners of the gas and go station on the corner. I thought he was a silent partner living out of state. Brett Davis is the one who runs the place. Not anymore, Josie said. Brett is selling his share to Pete because they haven't been getting along. She leaned forward, lowering her voice a bit so that Annie had to strain to hear. Word is that the sale isn't going well, because Pete doesn't want to pay what Brett's lawyer is claiming his portion is worth. It's a big hot mess. Really? I hadn't heard anything about it. Thanks Josie. Anytime. Josie sent him a sly grin before turning away. Annie raised a brow as Jason slid in across from her. Josie really does know everything that goes on around here, doesn't she? Yeah, and she manages to get the scoop before anyone else does, he said with a sigh. You're sure you don't know Pete Landry? Haven't met him at some point? I'm positive. She shook her head. Never heard of him although of course, I've filled up with fuel at the gas and go station just like everyone else. Me too. His gaze was pensive for a moment before he waved a hand at her mostly empty glass. Would you like more lemonade? She pushed it off to the side. No thanks. I'm finished with my dinner, anyway. He looked at her half-eaten meal, but didn't say anything more. While he downed the rest of his burger, she signaled for Josie. Could I get a to-go bag for the leftovers, she asked. Of course. Josie disappeared and returned with a cardboard container and a brown paper bag. What about you, Deputy Thomas? Do you want your usual dessert? Today's special is cherry pie, warm from the oven topped with vanilla bean ice cream. The tips of his ears turned red, as if he were embarrassed, but then he grinned and nodded. Sure, but bring two forks so Annie can share it with me. Josie's wide knowing smile made her want to sink into her seat away from her curiously prying eyes. What was Jason thinking? Share desert? That seemed too intimate, too personal for friends. When Josie set the small plate of cherry pie topped with ice cream between them, then slid clean forks across the table, Annie clasped her hands together in her lap. You first, Jason said. No thanks. Really I'm stuffed. He frowned a little, as if seeing through her white lie and took a tentative bite. Um. You don't know what you're missing. The pies here are always incredible. Truth be told, the cherry pie and the slowly melting ice cream did look absolutely delicious. One bite, he encouraged. Please? I feel like a jerk eating the whole thing by myself. You're hardly a jerk. She glanced around the cafe, relieved that no one else appeared to be watching them. Well, except of course for Josie, who probably already had them practically engaged. The thought made her smile. You should do that more often, Jason said. When she stared at him in confusion, he added, smile. You're beautiful when you smile. Beautiful? No one had ever called her beautiful, not even Kurt back in the early days. And why was she being so cautious anyway? So what if they shared desert? It was no one else's business but hers as to who she shared a meal with. Thank you. She picked up her fork and took a small bite. The tart cherry flavor exploded on her tongue. Oh, it really is delicious. Told you, he said with a smug smile. Never pass up the chance to taste one of Josie's special pies. Between the two of them they finished off the pie, and Annie had to admit she'd eaten her fair share. Now I really am stuffed. Me too. He waved at Josie, who immediately came over with the bill. Thanks, it was great as usual. Told you, didn't I? Josie said, looking at Annie. She blinked and shrugged, not understanding the woman's train of thought. She let out a long sigh. You forgot my advice already. The way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Oh that. Annie had to repress a giggle. If that was truly the case, why wasn't Josie married? She decided not to ask. I guess you're right. Of course I'm right. Josie picked up their dirty dishes and swept away as if miffed that there was ever a doubt. Which only made Annie giggle. She's something. With a heart of gold, Jason pointed out as he pulled out his wallet. She talks a lot, 
but she wouldn't ever purposefully hurt anyone. You should let me pay half, she said, mentally counting the cash in her wallet. Not happening. Jason set down a twenty, then rose to his feet and offered her a hand. I told you my treat. You did me a favor by joining me, it was nice not having to eat alone. Since it wasn't a date, she acquiesced. Okay, but after I get my first paycheck, it will be my turn to treat. He didn't say anything, but rested his hand in the small of her back as she picked up her leftovers and headed for the door. Bye Josie, she called over her shoulder. Good night, hope you both stop in again soon. We will, Jason said, moving over so he could reach over her shoulder to hold the door open for her. The hour wasn't that late, barely seven o'clock, but without the full force of the sun, the temperature had dropped low enough to make her shiver. Are you cold? Jason asked with concern. He moved closer, as if willing to share some of his body heat. Whoa, where had that thought come from? This wasn't a date. I'll be fine. She picked up her pace in an attempt to warm up. My car isn't far. True to her word, they reached the parking lot of the sheriff's department headquarters in record time. She unlocked the car and opened the passenger door so she could set her leftovers on the seat. Thanks for dinner, she said as she came around to the driver's side. I hope Josie doesn't spread too many rumors about us. I'm not worried. Jason opened her car door. I'll follow you home. There's no need for that, I'm sure I'll be safe. She brushed past him to slide in behind the wheel. Thanks again. See you around. At church on Sunday, right? She was surprised but glad he'd mentioned it. Yes, absolutely. That would be wonderful. See you then. He nodded and then stepped back so she could close the car door. She felt a bit self-conscious as she started the engine and put the gear shift into reverse. There was no reason to be nervous, she was a good, cautious driver, but for some odd reason her gaze kept returning to her rear-view mirror, watching until he disappeared from view. Jason was a nice guy. It had been wrong to avoid the police the way she had. Thinking back to what her therapist had told her, she'd probably done that out of embarrassment and shame, until it had become an ingrained habit. Another holdover from living with Kurt. Okay, starting now she was going to be open and friendly with whoever she happened to meet. People like Josie, who looked to be roughly her own age. Someone who she would have been friends with if things had been different. Well, they were different now. So maybe she'd try harder to come out of her protective shell and get to know the townsfolk living around her. She already had her first friend in Jason Thomas. Why not add a few more? Female friends might be safer, since she couldn't seem to get the scent of Jason's woodsy aftershave out of her head. Ridiculous to have a goofy crush on someone at her age. Especially on a guy who was three years younger than her. She was out of practice interacting with the opposite sex, that's all. Not at all used to being with someone so polite, yet funny at the same time. Enough. She needed to stop thinking about Jason as a man she might have once been interested in, to a friend who needed a little help rediscovering his faith. The tension eased from her chest. Yes, that was much better. Attending church with him would help her put all this nonsense aside. Relieved to have things back in perspective, she headed back toward home. The sun was slipping past the horizon as she turned onto County Highway ZZ. Crash. The unexpectedly loud noise was quickly followed by her windshield shattering into a spiderweb of thousands of tiny pieces, instantly obscuring her vision. Swallowing a scream, she instinctively slammed her foot onto the brake and yanked the steering wheel hard to the right hoping she was getting off onto the side of the road and out of traffic. Her car came to a jarring thud as she rammed into something hard. A tree. She wasn't sure, but there was a lot of green foliage outside her passenger side window, making her fear that she'd gone further off the road than she'd intended. She turned off the engine, worried that it might start on fire, then sat in stunned silence for a long moment, listening intently for any indication that someone was still out there waiting for her. Paranoid or not, she firmly believed that whatever had struck her windshield hadn't been an accident. The image of the threat sprawled across her front door flashed in her mind. Leave or die. 
Not an idle threat considering the fact that if she'd have been going any faster, or if there had been a lot of other cars on the road, she might have crashed worse than she had. Which brought her back to the original question. Who hated her this much? And why? 4. Annie. Jason stared in horror. Annie's car was smashed against a tree a few yards off Highway ZZ. He pulled in behind her then shot out of his squad, his heart thundering in his chest. Annie? Are you okay? Jason? Her faint voice brought a wave of relief. Talking was good, it meant she wasn't unconscious. Or dead. Thank you God. He hadn't prayed in years, but for some reason the words echoed silently in his mind as he yanked open the driver's side door. The first thing he noticed was Annie's pale face. The second thing he saw was the shattered windshield. Which didn't make any sense as the airbag hadn't deployed. Are you alright? He lowered himself to one knee so that he could look her in the eye. Did you hit your head? Break any bones? Just a bit shaken up, that's all. Abruptly, her eyes filled with tears. My car is probably totaled, though. Hey, it's okay. He gently patted her shoulder, hating to see her so upset. If you're fine, that's all that matters. Can you tell me what happened? She wiped at her face and sniffled loudly. I'm not sure, but I think someone threw a rock at my car. There was a loud sound and instantly the windshield shattered. I wasn't going very fast and I couldn't see, but did my best to get off the road, then I hit the tree. That would explain why her airbag hadn't deployed. She must not have hit the tree hard enough. Let's get you out of here. She unbuckled her seatbelt, then reached over to get her bag of leftovers from the floor of the passenger side seat, along with her purse. The fact that she remembered her personal items was reassuring, he didn't see any blood or other indication that she'd hit her head. He escorted her to his squad and opened the door for her. Have a seat, I'm going to take a little look around. Oh okay. The urge to hug her was strong, but he forced himself to step back and to close the door, keeping her safe inside. Then he turned and scanned his gaze over the area. Whoever had thrown the rock was likely long gone, especially now that he'd arrived on the scene. Good thing he'd listened to his gut instincts and had decided to follow her home. Following the trail of tiny bits of glass, he walked back roughly ten feet down the side of the road. Glancing back and eyeing the trajectory of her vehicle, he figured this was the spot where the incident had taken place. From there he crossed the road, inspecting the ground on the other side. There. A rock the size of a fist sat at a weird angle, as if it had rolled a bit before coming to a stop and there was a gouge along one side of the rock where it had hit the windshield with enough force to leave a mark. He pulled an evidence bag from his pocket and carefully picked it up without touching it with his bare hands. Fingerprints wouldn't be easy to take from the asymmetrical and ridged surface, but it was always worth a shot. And forensic evidence would likely prove there was glass shards embedded in the groove. Rising to his feet, he crossed over to the opposite side and tried to figure out where the perp had been standing. And who had done such a thing? A teenager? Or an adult? Jason thought again about Pete Landry, the man who'd roughly jostled Annie's arm while leaving the cafe. It didn't make sense that a guy in the middle of buying out a partner would bother leaving a death threat or throwing a rock at a woman like Annie. Even if Pete did carry some sort of grudge against her dead husband, why bother with the Theatrix, drawing unwanted attention to himself? And why would he take it out on Annie? None of this made any sense. He made a mental note to check into Pete Landry's background, then aimed his flashlight on the ground, looking for evidence that someone had been there recently. It took a few minutes for him to find the area where twigs were broken, and leaves were trampled flat against the ground. Unfortunately there wasn't a good footprint to estimate the size of the perp, just enough proof that someone had been standing there recently. But who? And why had he or she targeted Annie? Frustrated, he returned to his squad. He set the evidence bag containing the rock on the back seat, then slid in behind the wheel. When he glanced at Annie, he frowned at the dampness around her eyes. Sorry, she mumbled swiping at her eyes. It's all so overwhelming. 
Not just that someone tried to hurt me, but that my car is damaged beyond repair. It's not worth much, but it was enough to get me to work and back. Hey, it's okay. He reached over and took her hand in his. You have a right to be upset. I'll help you out so try not to worry. I can give you a lift to work tomorrow. In the meantime, I need to call Henry at Billy's garage, see if he can tow your car. Henry owns Billy's. And Josie owns Rose's Cafe. They just buy out businesses without changing the name? Her tone was full of disbelief, and it bothered him to realize that despite the fact that Annie had lived just outside of Crystal Lake for years, she didn't really know any of the residents on a personal level. So why on earth did one of them want to hurt her? Yeah, I guess people are settled in their ways. He started the engine and made a U-turn. Where are you going? Annie asked in dismay. He steeled himself for an argument. It's not safe for you to stay in that cabin, alone Annie. Well I'm certainly not staying with you, she shot back. Not with me exactly but I own a side-by-side -side townhouse, bought it late last year as a rental property. I live in one side, and the other side happens to be available for a few weeks. Isn't that convenient, she muttered. I rented the other side for June, July, and August to a couple of teachers from Chicago. So yeah, it is a bit convenient. At least you'll be safe there for a couple of days until we get to the bottom of this. A couple of days? She scoffed and he couldn't really blame her. I'm sure it will take longer than that. Maybe, but there's always the chance we'll find a fingerprint match to lead us in the right direction. He didn't add the fact that these recent incidents, the threat on her door and the rock, didn't exactly come across as someone who was rational and organized. It was almost as if this particular perp saw an opportunity and jumped on it. And if that was the case, there was a good chance that he or she would make a mistake, sooner rather than later. Please take me back to my place, Annie said. I have food there, and it would be nice to pack a bag. It was a reasonable request, one he couldn't refuse. Okay, I'll go back there, but Annie. He waited for her to look over at him. I can't let you stay behind alone, so if you insist, I'll just camp out there with you. Understand? She let out a heavy sigh. Of course I understand. I'm not stupid. Whoever threw that rock wasn't playing around. Throwing a rock and smashing my windshield while I'm driving is a far cry from writing some stupid threat on my front door. The tightness across his chest eased. Good. Thanks. She shook her head. I'm the one who should be thanking you. I'm glad you arrived as quickly as you did. She abruptly frowned. How did you get there so fast? Were you following me home? Yes I was. Don't look at me like that. Her glare was palpable, I couldn't shake the idea you were still in danger. He executed another sharp U-turn to head back to her place. Although even being a few minutes behind you wasn't enough to prevent the attack or your subsequent crash. She scrubbed her hands over her face. I just don't understand why this is happening. I know. The urge to pull her close was strong, so he tightened his grip on the steering wheel. Being a cop and protecting the public was a normal part of his job, yet Annie brought out his protective instincts in a big way. But I promise I won't rest until I figure it out. She placed her hand lightly on his forearm. I know you will. I'm not used to counting on the police for help and support, although much of that was my own fault. Still I trust you Jason. Her trust was a precious gift, one he didn't deserve. He needed to tell her the truth about the role he'd played in her husband's death. Not an easy conversation for sure. He pulled into her driveway for the second time that day, and stopped near the front door. Wait for me, he said as he pushed out from behind the wheel. When he was certain the area was deserted, he opened her door for her and followed her inside. Annie didn't say anything, before disappearing into the bedroom. When she brought out a small suitcase, he took it from her hands. Get your groceries together while I store this in the squad. Sure. When he returned, she was still packing the food she purchased earlier into a large plastic bag. It didn't look like nearly enough food to last through the weekend, but he didn't voice his concern. 
She'd mentioned taking a turn paying for their meals once she received her first paycheck, and he wondered how long it would be until she received one. Too far off to be of any help in paying for the repairs on her car, that's for sure. When she'd finished with the groceries, he picked up the bag and glanced around. Do you need anything else? No. Her voice was firm. Then let's go. Five minutes later, they were settled in the squad. Annie didn't bother to look back at the cabin as he drove away, and he remembered how she planned to put the place up for sale. I know a relator in the area if you're seriously interested listing the cabin on the market, he said as he turned onto County Road ZZ. With all the tourists coming in this summer, you won't find a better time. Good point. Yes, I absolutely want to sell. And I appreciate the referral. Her name is Suzanne White, and she lists properties all over Hope County. He glanced at her. When is your next day off? I'm off Sunday and Monday. He lifted a brow. Me too. How about that? I'll give Suzanne a call and set something up for Monday if that's okay with you. For the first time since he'd found her car smashed up against a tree, she smiled. A real smile that actually reached her eyes. Sounds great. Thanks. The rest of the drive to his side-by-side -side townhouse, the one he'd purchased from Julie and Derek Ryerson, passed in silence. As much as he knew he needed to tell Annie the truth about what he'd done, he didn't think this was a good time. She needed to feel safe and secure after what had happened on the highway, not knocked off balance. Besides, she needed to work in the morning, the same way he did. Upsetting her was the last thing he wanted to do. He pulled into the driveway of the rented side. This is where you'll be staying. Looks nice, she said politely. Then her eyes widened in surprise. You live on the lake. He grinned. Yes. There's a shared pier too, which is exactly why I bought the place. It's proving to be a hot rental property for the summertime. It's awfully generous of you to let me stay for a few days, Annie murmured as he unlocked the front door. I'll make sure to clean up afterwards. No one is coming in until June 1st, you can stay until the 31. He pushed the door open and gestured for her to go inside. But I'll take you up on that offer to spruce things up, I'm afraid it's a bit dusty in here. Not a problem. She smiled shyly at him over her shoulder. I enjoy cleaning. Yeah right. No one likes cleaning, he countered dryly, following her inside and setting her groceries on the table. But it's nice of you to say so. Wait here, I'll get your suitcase. By the time he'd returned, she had most of the groceries put away. He set her case on the floor and then tucked his hands into his pockets. There are sheets and towels in the hallway closet, help yourself. He took the key off his chain and set it on the counter. What time is your shift tomorrow? 7 minus 3 to 30. Why, what time do you go in? By 8, so there's plenty of time for me to drop you off at the hospital before I report for duty. I'll take some vacation time so I can pick you up at 3.30. No need, I can wait at the hospital for you to finish. I'll bring a book to read. I love novels by Karen Kingsbury. He nodded, even though he had no clue who Karen Kingsbury was. Okay, I'll do my best to be there on time, but in this job I can't always guarantee that will happen, so please do bring a book. No reason to rush, I'll be fine. She took a step toward him, then stopped. Thanks again, Jason. For everything. He reached out and took her hand, giving it a gentle squeeze. You're welcome. Good night, Annie. I'll see you bright and early in the morning. Their fingers clung for a moment before she pulled away. I'll be ready. He didn't want to leave, but of course he did. But his side of the townhouse seemed too empty and too quiet. Maybe he should get a dog, although it didn't seem fair to leave an animal here alone while he worked all day long and often unpredictable hours. He didn't sleep well either, but dragged himself up early the next morning so that he could make breakfast for the two of them before they headed off to work. Crazy how much he looked forward to seeing Annie again. Wait a minute. What was he thinking? He wasn't seeing Annie. He was helping her. Giving her a hand. As a friend that's all.
She didn't like police, and even if she trusted him, she didn't know the truth. He couldn't afford to let himself get too attached. No matter how much he liked and admired her, satisfied that he had Annie tucked back in the friendship compartment where she belonged, he headed into the kitchen and started a pot of coffee. While that was brewing, he broke a half dozen eggs into a bowl and whipped them with some milk. He popped a couple of slices of bread into the toaster, then went back to scrambling the eggs. When he had breakfast just about finished, he walked outside through the front door, rather than using the patio doors that overlooked the lake, and lightly rapped on her door. No response. Annie. He knocked again, louder. Annie, are you okay? Still nothing. A flash of panic hit hard. What if whoever had thrown the rock had anticipated he'd bring Annie to his townhouse? What if that same person had broken in and harmed her? Annie. He darted back into his place to find the master key, and then ran back over to unlock the front door of the townhouse. He burst inside, raking his gaze over the interior, looking for signs of something amiss. The kitchen was clean and empty. He slowly made his way down the short hallway leading to the two bedrooms and single bathroom, but those rooms were empty too. The suitcase was sitting beside the dresser, and when he opened the drawers he found Annie's clothing neatly folded tucked inside. Okay, she hadn't up and left. He frowned and returned to the main living area, turning in a full circle. Her purse was sitting on the counter, causing his gut to knot with worry. Would she leave of her own volition without her purse? He doubted it. So where was she? 5. Annie sat on the edge of the pier, dangling her feet in the cold water. The lake was mesmerizing, quiet and peaceful this early in the morning, and she enjoyed watching the ripples from the fish darting to the surface then diving back down again. Caddy corner from where she was sitting, she caught a glimpse of the same young girl who'd she'd registered yesterday in the er, the one with the small laceration on her forehead. She stared at the cozy house, but as soon as the little girl had come outside, her harried mother had dragged her back inside. Nothing to worry about, she reminded herself. Toddlers often ran around and fell down. No reason to fear the child's mother was responsible. Turning her attention back to the water, she thought about how nice it would be to live on the lake. She'd love to come out here every morning with a cup of coffee, and simply spend the first moments of her day in peace and serenity. But this wasn't her home nor would it ever be something she could afford, so better not to dream about something so far out of reach. Checking her watch she winced as she realized she'd been out here longer than she'd anticipated. Reluctantly, she pulled her feet from the water, the slight breeze making her shiver. She rose to her feet and turned toward the side-by-side -side when she saw Jason bolting out from her set of patio doors. Annie. Didn't you hear me calling you? No, I didn't. She scowled with a rare flash of anger. What were you doing in my side? He grimaced, looking contrite. I'm sorry, but when you didn't answer my knock, I was worried something had happened, so I used my master key to get inside. But it's barely ten minutes past six, we don't have to leave for a while yet. She didn't understand why on earth he'd gone looking for her so early. She tried not to sound resentful. The hospital isn't far. I made breakfast for us. He winced and turned toward the patio doors on his side. Hopefully the eggs aren't burnt. He'd cooked breakfast. For both of them. She slowly followed, feeling a bit dazed. Her anger evaporated, and she found herself touched by his thoughtfulness. No man had ever cooked a meal for her before. Certainly not Kurt. Cooking was women's work, and even then he'd often criticized her efforts. Stop it. No reason to keep dwelling on her dead husband. It had been three years, it was time to let it go. Thankfully they're not scorched, Jason said as she entered the patio doors. I, uh, hope you like cheesy eggs and toast. She peered over his shoulder, catching a whiff of his woodsy aftershave. She swallowed hard and stepped back. Looks delicious. I can't believe you cooked breakfast. He looked surprised. Why is that so shocking? Okay yeah, Josie was right about one thing, I like to eat. But I don't need a woman to cook for me, I'm perfectly capable of making my own meals. 
and it's just as easy to cook for two people, so I thought it would be neighborly to invite you to join me. Aya, thank you. She told herself not to read too much into his kind gesture. He was certainly taking this friendship thing to heart. He dished up the eggs, toast, and handed her a plate. Would you like coffee? Sure, although I tend to use cream or milk. Plenty of milk in the fridge. He pulled out the nearly full gallon and set it beside her cup. Help yourself. She added a generous portion to her mug, then took the seat across from him. She bowed her head and said grace. Dear Lord, we thank you for this food we are about to eat. We ask for your strength and guidance as we work today. In your name, Amen. Amen, Jason said softly, making her smile. The food was delicious or maybe it just tasted better than what she normally made, because someone had cared enough to give her a hand. If not for Jason's assistance last night and now today, she may not have been able to keep her job at the hospital. Just the thought of how much the repairs to her car might be made her feel sick. When she finished eating, she jumped up and began clearing the table. You don't have to do that, he protested. Yes I do. And it won't take me long so just sit back and enjoy your coffee. She wasn't helpless, the very least she could do was to clean up after he bothered to cook. But Jason ignored her and came over to stand beside her at the sink. It will go faster if we work together. You can wash and I'll dry since I know where everything goes. Again, she wasn't used to a man offering to help, and while she appreciated Jason's gesture, being this close to him, working alongside him created an intimacy that wreaked havoc with her emotions. She washed the dishes in record time, then stepped back from the sink. I'll get ready and meet you out front in a few minutes, okay? Before he could respond, she slipped through the patio doors and escaped. What on earth was wrong with her? Being attracted to the first guy to be nice to her in like, forever, wasn't smart. This was nothing more than a ridiculous case of hero worship. And it needed to stop, before he figured it out. Wasn't the fact that he knew about her situation, mortifying enough? Did she have to add this attraction too? The ride to Hope County Hospital didn't take long. She clocked in and took a seat at her desk, diving right into work. The night shift had been busy, so there was plenty to keep her occupied. And she didn't waste time thinking about Jason Thomas, at least not very much. Her day flew by and when 3.30 came around, she punched out and double-checked the schedule, searching for extra hours. She'd wanted a full-time job, but the only opening had been part-time, so she'd snapped it up, hoping that she'd be able to pick up hours covering other people's vacations. Obviously she didn't have any vacation plans. Her scheduled shifts were Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday of the following week, and it looked as if the weekend was open so she quickly claimed both Saturday and Sunday. She didn't like missing church services, but she was fairly sure both Pastor John and God would understand. She sat outside reading her book until Jason arrived. He pulled up along the curb at quarter to five. Sorry I'm late, he said, jumping out and opening the passenger door for her. Had to break up a fight at a party outside of town. A fight? Her stomach clenched but she forced a smile. Not a problem, I was able to finish my book. Now I can return this one to the library and get another. Once they were both seated, he glanced at her. I'll need to drop you off, then go back into work for a while. His tone was apologetic. One of the second shift deputies called in sick, so I'm working an extra four hours. It's not good to be short-staffed on a Saturday night. She ignored the sharp stab of disappointment. I'm sure the weekend nights are busy. Not a problem, I'll be fine sitting and watching the lake. Yeah, I was hoping we could grill out tonight, but maybe we can do that tomorrow instead. Grill out? Together? Her heart did a crazy flip. I'm sure. That sounds nice. But I don't want you to feel like you have to feed me or anything. I'll be fine on my own. I know you're fine, but it just seems silly for each of us to make separate meals. And it's nice not eating alone. She highly doubted that he'd make the same offer to the teachers who were renting from him for the summer, but she decided not to point that out. Only if you let me bring something, she said as he headed down Main Street. 
I'll make a large salad if that's okay with you. Perfect. He pulled into the driveway of his townhouse. Thanks for the ride, she said, pushing her door open. For once he didn't jump out and run around to open her side. See you in the morning, if you're still interested in attending church services. Okay, see you then. She slammed the door and offered a small wave before going up to let herself inside. The townhouse was exactly the way she'd left it, but seemed empty tonight compared to yesterday when she'd found comfort in knowing that Jason was right next door if she needed him. After eating her leftover grilled chicken sandwich for dinner, she began to clean. First she scrubbed the kitchen, then made her way into the bathroom. By the time she'd finished, she was exhausted enough to fall asleep. Or so she thought. No matter how tired she was physically, her mind wouldn't rest. Every tiny sound had her opening her eyes and straining to listen. Nine o'clock passed, then ten. Shouldn't Jason be home by now? At 10.30 she heard the distinct sound of a door slamming shut. She breathed a sigh of relief. Finally Jason had made it home, safely. Now she could sleep. The following morning, Annie awoke to the sun shining in through the bedroom window. She'd slept in later than normal, 7.30, but still had plenty of time before she needed to get ready for church. She wondered if Jason would still accompany her, but she also knew not to get her hopes up. He'd worked late and deserved to sleep in. Breakfast was a quick bowl of instant oatmeal. She hadn't bought coffee, unwilling to spend her money on non-necessities, so when she finished eating, she headed outside, walking down to the pier overlooking the lake. There were a few fishing boats out today, one young couple, and the other two were solitary older men ages anywhere between 40 and 70, hard to tell from this distance. She sat down to dangle her feet in the water, and lifted her face to the sun. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing me here even temporarily. Annie wasn't sure how much time passed before she heard the creak of wood behind her. She turned to see Jason standing there, wearing a pair of tan dress slacks and a burnt orange shirt open at the collar. His dark brown hair was damp from a recent shower, and once again, she caught the scent of his woodsy aftershave intermixed with the coffee wafting from his mug. It wasn't fair that he was so handsome and young, and nice. Good morning. She strove for a laid-back friendly tone. You must have been super busy last night. As soon as the words left her mouth, she wanted to call them back. Now he'd know that she'd stayed awake until he'd returned home. Yeah, but at least we both have the next couple of days off. Do you want breakfast? No, I already ate, thanks. She pulled her feet out of the water. But I wouldn't mind a cup of coffee. If you have enough to spare. He grinned. Of course, come on up. Normally she wasn't so bold as to invite herself in for coffee, but she knew he wouldn't mind. As she poured herself a cup and doused it with milk, he placed several slices of French toast on his plate. Are you sure you don't want some, he offered. I made extra. She suppressed a sigh and gave in. I'll have one slice. She joined him at the table. He picked up his fork, hesitated, then looked at her with a guilty expression. I almost forgot to pray. It's okay. She quickly said grace and this time he joined in as soon as she said amen. As they ate, he filled her in on what had happened the night before. Just before he was ready to head home, they'd gotten word of a party full of underage drinkers. By the time I got everything sorted out and tickets written, it was late. Then I had to still write up my report. At least they didn't hurt anyone, but it was still stupid of them to have a party like that. She thought of her own son Tommy, who'd had a terrible drinking problem when he was a teenager. Of course, Kurt had been a big part of the reason why, he'd actually encouraged Tommy to drink starting at the early age of 14. Tommy and Kurt had bonded over hunting, fishing, and drinking beer. Until Tommy had gotten two OWIs in a row, and had caused a serious car crash. He'd ended up in jail, and instead of being on his best behavior, he'd gotten into more fights, which had added several months onto his sentence. She'd tried to visit him several times, but he'd refused to see her. The only explanation she could come up with is that Tommy must blame her for Kurt's death. Her son's rejection hurt, but she wasn't sure what she could do to change things. 
except to continue praying. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have brought up a sore subject, Jason said, apparently reading her thoughts. No need to apologize. I love my son, but he and Kurt were inseparable. She forced a smile and finished her last bite of French toast. This was great thanks. Like the day before they worked together to clean up the kitchen. Since it was a nice day, she suggested they walk to church and Jason agreed. It wasn't until they were heading up to the front of the church together that she realized people were staring at them curiously. If eating dinner together at the cafe wasn't bad enough, the rumors would really run rampant now that they'd walk to church together. Good morning Pastor John, she said in a loud voice. This is a friend of mine, Deputy Jason Thomas. Nice to see you Deputy, Pastor John said, shaking his hand. You're always welcome here. Thanks, Jason replied, looking a bit uncomfortable. As they walked inside, she took her usual seat toward the back. Jason didn't seem to mind, and it soon became obvious he knew more of the parishioners by name than she did. The service was centered around forgiveness, and she did her best to let go of the bit of resentment she carried toward Kurt and Tommy, too. Her son had seen his father's abuse but hadn't attempted to stop it. But he was also a child who idolized his father, so he wasn't to blame. In fact, she'd often felt as if it was her fault for not taking Tommy away from Kurt's influence. When the service was over, Jason took her hand in his as they filed outside. That was nice, he said. I expected more preaching, but instead he told stories. She smiled. Pastor John has a nice way of getting through to people using everyday examples, doesn't he? Jason nodded. You were right about forgiveness. Darla hurt me, but she didn't deserve to die young either. I'm glad. I've been working on forgiveness too. A shadow darkened his eyes, and he looked away. How about a walk down Main Street? I'd like to talk to you, if you don't mind. Talk? She wasn't sure that whatever he wanted to say was good news, but she nodded. Sure. Jason kept his pace slow, likely in deference to her injured hip, and as they approached the ice cream parlor, she couldn't help slowing to peer inside. Something look good, he asked. I've driven past here my entire life but never stopped in, she confessed. I know you want to talk, but maybe we can chat over ice cream. My treat, she hastily added. I can't let you pay, Jason argued as he opened the door for her. Sure you can. She had her money out of her purse before he could complain. Single scoop of cookie dough for me. I'll have a scoop of the double chocolate. After they both had their cones, he tipped his chin toward the door. Let's sit outside at one of the tables. Sounds good. She licked her cone. The ice cream tasted amazing. As she walked outside she stopped abruptly when she saw the woman and the little girl from the Ur standing there. Oh hi, Annie greeted them, unsure of what the proper protocol was. There were privacy rules, but it seemed strange to pretend as if they'd never seen each other. You. The woman glared at her and took the little girl's hand. Stay away from us, understand? Come on, Carly. She tugged at the child's arm, practically dragging her away from the ice cream parlor leaving Annie to stare after them in shocked surprise. What was that all about? Jason asked. I don't know, she confessed. All I did was say hello, but she acted as if I was some sort of leper. Jason scowled. What's her name? She hesitated. The only reason she knew the woman's name, Bridget Walsh and her daughter Carly, was because she worked in the emergency department and had registered them both when they'd come in. It doesn't matter. Annie, I can tell something is bothering you. He guided her to the closest empty picnic table. What's wrong? It's nothing really. When he continued to look at her, she sighed. The little girl fell and cut her forehead. She's not quite three years old, and toddlers are often impulsive. I'm sure it was an accident. Understanding dawned in his eyes. You were concerned about potential abuse. She couldn't deny it. There's no reason to suspect abuse. The little girl admitted she tripped and fell on a rock. She didn't seem afraid of her mother or act as if she'd been coached. I let my imagination run wild, that's all. 
Jason nodded and let the subject drop as they ate their ice cream, but she couldn't dismiss the woman's strange reaction as easily. Bridget Walsh resented her, and she had no idea why. She'd never even met the woman until yesterday. Once again, her reputation as a hinkle preceded her. And it struck her that coming back to Crystal Lake may have been another in a long line of mistakes. 6. Jason finished his ice cream a few minutes after Annie finished hers, knowing that he'd stalled long enough. It was well past time to tell Annie the truth. Hearing the sermon this morning around forgiveness gave him a kernel of hope that she may not hate him once they'd talked. But he braced himself for the worst. Annie, there's something important I need to tell you. Okay. Since she still looked distracted, he reached across the table and took her hand in his. Annie, this is serious. Her bright blue gaze finally focused on his, shadowed by a hint of trepidation. What is it? Jason took a deep breath and let it out slowly. I was there in the emergency department the night your husband was shot. She frowned in confusion. In the er. You mean you followed him there after he was injured? Apparently she didn't know any of the details surrounding that night. He stared at the plastic tabletop surface for a moment, then forced himself to meet her gaze. Kurt brought a gun to the emergency department with the intent to kill Larissa, one of the nurses who worked there. Larissa, Annie whispered, her eyes going wide. I remember her, she was the one who tried to help me the day Kurt broke my wrist. She gave me her phone number, and I even tried to call her once. The blood drained from her face. D did Kurt H hurt her? No. Larissa and Gabe are both fine. They're married now and have two beautiful children. Annie relaxed as if reassured by the news, but then understanding sank deep. You were the deputy who shot him. He wished there was a way to deny it, but he refused to lie to her. Yes? She nodded slowly. You prevented him from hurting anyone else. Yes, he said again. I could tell you I didn't intend to kill him but I did aim for center mass, the way we're taught. So the bullet hit him in his chest. Larissa and Gabe both instantly worked on saving his life, but well, you know the rest. He died of complications from his chest wound. I know. The doctor told me when I regained consciousness after three different surgeries. She shrugged. I've blocked out everything surrounding the accident, and I don't remember much of the details the police told me. Kurt had already been dead for a week by then, and I was still a long ways from being discharged. I heard Tommy made Kurt's funeral arrangements. His heart ached for her. Hearing Pastor John talking about forgiveness today helped give me the strength to tell you the truth. I hope you can find a way to forgive me. Forgive you? Now she looked confused. Why would I need to do that? I don't blame you for Kurt's death. He was the one who picked up a gun and went to seek revenge, because apparently hurting me wasn't good enough. His actions caused his death, not you. His chest filled with cautious hope. I like you, Annie. I like spending time with you, and I can't stand the thought of you beginning to resent me for doing my job. She tipped her head to the side and offered him a faint smile. I like you too, Jason. And I would never hold Kurt's death against you. If we're being honest, I haven't been able to mourn Kurt's passing. My only regret is losing all contact with my son. Maybe if I'd been strong enough to leave Kurt earlier, Tommy wouldn't be in prison right now. I've tried to visit him, but he won't see me. I'm sure he holds me responsible for Kurt's death. He couldn't imagine how painful it must be to have a son that wouldn't talk to you. Annie had lost everyone in her life, but yet here she was, attempting to start over. Annie. He gently tugged her hand, bringing her up on her feet. You're the most beautiful, courageous, and kind woman I've ever known. Me? Her voice came out in a breathless squeak that made him smile. And because she looked so surprised to be considered attractive, he bent his head and kissed her. For a half of a second she held herself still, then she tentatively kissed him back. He drew her closer, but when he heard a wolf whistle from one of the people passing by, he lifted his head, struggling to breathe normally. Wow, he whispered. You're amazing. 
She hid her face against his chest and shook her head. Trust me, you're the only person in this entire town who thinks that. Not true. He smoothed a hand down her back. Josie likes you. And so does Pastor John, who is hopefully married with children of his own. That made her laugh. You're crazy, you know that? She lifted her head and stepped back so he reluctantly let her go. Pastor John is a widower, his wife died shortly after they were married, and he doesn't have any children, but what that has to do with anything we're discussing is beyond my comprehension. No reason to burst her bubble. He knew when a man had eyes for a particular woman, and he'd gotten the distinct sense that Pastor John was interested in Annie, more than as a parishioner. Too bad for the good pastor, he'd seen her first. On the heels of that thought came a wave of guilt. Pastor John could give Annie what he couldn't. Children. She was 41, but that didn't mean anything. Women were having children at older ages nowadays, weren't they? If she really wanted to start over, she could easily do that with a man like the church pastor. He never should have kissed her. So much for keeping Annie in the friendship compartment. And now that he'd held her in his arms, there was no way to put her back there. At the same time, he knew she deserved better. Maybe she didn't care about his ability to father children, but cops didn't always make the best spouses. Being in constant danger was a lot for a wife to handle. Hadn't Annie been through enough violence? Absolutely. Since he was being honest with her, he figured it was only fair to keep going. Pastor John really likes you. No, he doesn't. You're imagining things. He wished he was. I'm a guy, so you need to believe me when I tell you he's interested. As polite as he was to me, he was obviously disappointed to see us together. Funny, I thought he looked happy to see you, he's always thrilled when stray lambs join his flock returning to their faith. She reached out and took his hand. We should head back to the townhouse. Unable to resist the touch of her hand, he fell into step beside her. The lake is getting crowded, she said, as they approached the shore, coming up on the townhouse from the backside rather than the front. No wonder we see so many boating accident victims in the ER. We take turns patrolling the lake, he told her. And we give out a lot of drinking and driving tickets. Still, it's impossible to catch them all and to be everywhere at once. The DNR comes in to help starting the 4th of July weekend. I like the lake early in the morning, before the boaters are out in full force. It's so quiet and peaceful. Me too. He glanced at her profile, enjoying the way the breeze played with strands of her brown hair. He cleared his throat, feeling unaccountably nervous. Are you up to grilling out tonight? I still have the brats and burgers in my fridge, the ones we were supposed to have last night. Her eyes lit up. I'd love to. And I still have enough veggies to make a salad as my contribution to the meal. Her being there with him was more than enough, but he nodded, understanding her need to remain independent. Salad sounds good to me. You already know I like to eat, and I'm not picky. Except when it comes to onions, she teased, remembering how he'd ordered his burger without them at the cafe. The tips of his ears burned. Hey, I like onions just fine but they don't like me. We're both better off if I stay far away from them. She laughed, and he decided his personal goal would be to make her laugh more often. You think it's funny but trust me, it's so not. She giggled some more, then stopped so abruptly their hands pulled apart. Oh no, she whispered. What's wrong? Then he saw it, the large broken window on the patio doors leading into her side of the townhouse. He swallowed a curse and shoved her behind him. Stay back I'm calling this in. Deputy Devin Armbrister arrived in less than 10 minutes. He examined the broken glass and peered inside. I see a brick sitting on the kitchen floor, he said. Any idea who you ticked off recently Jace? Come on Dev, we're cops, we're always making people mad when we arrest them, he countered. The list is longer than both of our arms, and that would be just from the people I interacted with over the last week. I could try to write some names down. The damage wasn't aimed at Jason, Annie interrupted. It's on the rented side, the one I'm temporarily staying in. She crossed her arms over her chest in that defensive way she had. 
It's just like the rock thrown at my windshield and the threat written on my front door. Whoever did this, she waved a hand, is upset with me. He felt as if he'd been kicked in the gut. She's right. I'm an idiot. I should have kept her location here a secret. Instead I kissed her in front of half the town. Really? Nice. Dev raised a brow and smirked. He let out a low groan. Devin was married to a nurse named Janelle, and they both formally adopted Janelle's nephew, Sebastian. Last he heard, Janelle was in the early stages of a new pregnancy too. Nothing was worse than newly married guys trying to get their single friends paired off. He forced himself to focus on the issue at hand. Throwing rocks and writing threats seems to be something a teenager or young adult would do, so maybe we should focus on Tommy's friends. He turned toward Annie as he warmed to the idea. You mentioned your son has been refusing to see you when you try to visit, but maybe he's been getting other visitors. Like from his friends. And one of those so-called friends might be targeting you, in retaliation. Good thought, Devin agreed. Miss Hinkle, would you be willing to give me a list? Rawson, he and Annie corrected Devin at the same time. Dev grinned again and Annie blushed. I took my maiden name back, so I'm officially Annie Rawson. And I can certainly try to give you a list, but Tommy wasn't exactly open with me about who he hung around with. I have a better idea. He turned toward Devon. Why don't we ask the corrections facility for a list of Tommy Hinkle's visitors over the past few years? I'm sure our perp's name will be there. For all we know, it could be a former girlfriend. Good idea, Devon agreed. Annie shrugged. I agree with checking the list of his visitors, but if Tommy had a girlfriend, he never mentioned her to me. And I didn't see him with any girls, either. To be honest, I was kind of glad, I was always worried he'd treat a girlfriend badly. Jason reached out to take her hand. A list of his friends would still be helpful. I'll give you the ones I remember. She wrinkled her forehead for a moment. Bobby Runge, Lewis Walker, and Steve Zimmer. He watched Devin write the names down, committing them to memory. Anyone else? Annie slowly shook her head. There may have been one more, but I can't think of his name offhand. I'm sure it will come to me later. I'll run these names down, see where these three are. Devin grimaced. Being Sunday, I doubt I'll be able to get in touch with anyone at the correction center today, so we may as well start with the three. Tommy could be writing letters to them, for all we know. Annie looked skeptical at the thought of her son handwriting letters to his friends, but didn't argue. He suspected the sad truth was that she didn't know anything about what her son was doing, since she hadn't seen him in the past three years. I'll take the brick, see if there's any chance to lift a couple of prints, Devin offered. I won't hold my breath, I tried to get something off the rock that smashed Annie's windshield but came up empty. What about from the door, she asked. I found one partial print, but nothing that matched anything we have in the system. And it's a small hand, so there's no guarantee it's connected to the threat. Could be a couple of kids looking for a place to party. She blew out a heavy breath. So we have nothing, except for suspicion surrounding Tommy's friends. The resigned expression in her eyes bothered him. Bad enough to have a husband who tried to kill you, but to have a son terrorizing you from prison. Why would that be any part of God's plan? After Devon left to follow up on the names of Tommy's friends, he began cleaning up the glass. When Annie tried to help, he caught her hands in his. Please sit down and let me take care of this. He tried to smile, but he was ticked at the way violence had followed her here to his house. Because he'd failed in keeping her safe. I have a better idea. You let me use the broom to clean up the glass, while you find a way to board up the broken window. The mosquitoes will have a field day with me if you don't. The stubborn glint was back in her eye so he reluctantly nodded. The broom is in the hall closet, and I'll get some plywood from the basement. Working together, it didn't take long to get the mess taken care of, and the patio door boarded up. He made a mental note to contact his insurance company first thing in the morning, he needed the door repaired before his summer tenants arrived. His to-do list for his day off was getting longer. 
He hadn't forgotten his promise to call his real estate friend to arrange a meeting for Suzanne White to meet Annie and to list her cabin for sale. And day off or not, he was definitely going to check on Dev's progress in following up on Tommy's friends and list of visitors. I feel terrible about this, Annie said, dropping down into one of the patio chairs surrounding the picnic table. If you've changed your mind about grilling out, I'll understand. You didn't throw the brick through the window, he responded in a dry tone. I believe we were together the entire time. She didn't return his smile. But if this is truly the work of Tommy's friends, that would make it Tommy's fault or that of the friend who tossed the brick, not yours. He tried to lighten the tone. Don't think you're off the hook here, I've been looking forward to that salad you promised. She rolled her eyes and her lips twitched. Yeah, I'm sure you've been thinking about the salad rather than the brats and the burgers. He'd been thinking about sharing a meal with Annie more than what they were having for dinner, but wasn't sure how she would feel about him telling her that. The last thing he wanted to do was to scare Annie off. Logically, he knew she deserved better, but since she didn't seem interested in Pastor John and she had kissed him back, then maybe just maybe he stood a chance. If she was willing to put up with the uncertainties of being married to a cop, and if she could learn not to associate him with her husband's death. For the first time in the years since Darla had left him, he was excited to see what the future might hold. 7. I need to make the salad. Annie knew her excuse was lame, but she needed some distance from Jason. A few minutes alone to erase the memory of their heated kiss. She slipped through the patio door and leaned heavily on the counter. What was going on here? How had sharing a friendly dinner, church services, and an ice cream cone turned into a warm embrace? Oh sure, she could have broken away from him, but the moment she'd tasted him, she'd been ravenous for more. With a low groan, she staggered over to the kitchen table. Sinking down into a chair, she cradled her head in her hands. To be completely honest, she couldn't remember the last time she'd been kissed. She and Kurt hadn't been physically close in many months, and while it was clear he'd lost interest in her, she couldn't deny being grateful. After taking several deep breaths, she lifted her head. Okay, so she hadn't experienced the sweetness of a kiss in years. That was the only reason she'd been instantly attracted to Jason. Any man who was kind and gentle would have made her feel the same way. On the heels of that thought came an instant rebellion. Nope. Not true. The image of Pastor John flashed into her mind's eye. Jason had claimed the man was interested in her, but she didn't feel the same way toward him. Just the thought of kissing the pastor made her cringe. Oh he was nice enough and handsome, but she wasn't attracted to him. Unfortunately, she only had eyes for Jason. A man three years her junior, who was so ruggedly attractive he could have any woman he wanted. Infertile or not, he was still a good catch, no matter what he believed to the contrary. And of course, there was no reason for him to be interested in someone like her. Someone who'd been a doormat, married to an abusive man and lacking the common sense to leave. So why had he kissed her? She thought back to their conversation. Oh yes, he'd felt guilty for being the one who'd shot Kurt and he was grateful for her not holding it against him. No doubt Jason had intended for the kiss to be friendly, sort of a thank you kiss. She's the one who'd acted crazy, kissing him back and clinging to his broad shoulders as if she'd never let him go. She'd thought that his knowing about her abuse had been mortifying, but the way she'd responded to his kiss was far worse. Okay, so she needed to suck it up and to move on. Find a way to bring things between them back to the friendship level. Satisfied that she had her emotions finally under control, she rose to her feet and headed for the fridge. Making the salad she'd promised didn't take long. Still, she took her time cleaning up the mess before carrying the large bowl outside through the patio doors. Jason stood at the grill, whistling as he flipped burgers and brats over red glowing coals. He glanced over when she approached and grinned. What would you like to drink? The innocent question immediately had her stiffening and scanning the area for signs of alcohol. When her gaze landed on a soft drink, she relaxed. What you're having is fine with me. Okay. 
He set down the tongs but she waved him off. Stay where you are, I'll get it. These will be fine for a moment. Why don't you sit down? I'll be back in a minute. The way he insisted on waiting on her was disconcerting. But she took a seat and gazed out at the lake. Despite the coolness of the evening, there were plenty of speedboats and water skiers out enjoying the day. Instinctively her gaze went over to the little white house where she'd caught a glimpse of Carly the other morning, but there was no sign of Carly or her mother Bridget. She shrugged. Just because they weren't outside enjoying the day, didn't mean the little girl was being abused, hiding away the way Annie used to do. She needed to stop dwelling on them. Jason returned with her soft drink, along with plates, bowls for their salads, silverware and condiments. I'll set the table, she said, taking the items from his hands. Their fingers brushed, and she felt the sizzle of electricity shoot all the way up her arm. Thanks. He returned to his task of tending to the grill. When their food was ready, he carried a heaping platter over to the picnic table. When he sat beside her, he reached out for her hand. She couldn't help but smile when he took the lead in saying grace. Dear Lord bless this food we are about to eat. Thank you for guiding us today and keeping us safe in your care, amen. Amen, she echoed. The meal was one of the best she'd ever had, and Jason kept her entertained with funny stories of calls he'd responded to. The guy ran out of his house stark naked and began dancing around us with his hands up in a boxer's stance, bobbing and weaving, daring us to try and take him in, he said. Dev and I glanced at each other incredulously, since we never planned on arresting him, we were only there because of the noise complaint. But I can guarantee that neither one of us really wanted to apprehend that guy while he was naked, we literally begged him to put clothes on. She laughed and shook her head. I can only imagine what you face every day. He shrugged and finished the last of his bratwurst. Hope County isn't a bad place, we rarely have real crime. Not since Kurt, huh? He grimaced. Sorry, guess I should have kept my mouth shut. No, it's my fault. She forced a smile. I don't like thinking of you facing armed men like him, that's all. Annie. He reached out to take her hand. I know cops are in danger but I always take precautions. And aren't you the one who told me to believe in God's plan? If that's true, then I'm a deputy sheriff here in Crystal Lake for a reason. She stared at their joined hands for a moment as realization sank deep. She knew what God's plan must have been. He'd put Jason there to prevent Kurt from hurting anyone else. And maybe if she'd have gone to the police earlier the way Larissa had encouraged, Jason would have been able to help her too. Only she hadn't given him the chance. Annie. His husky voice brought her back to the present. She looked into his eyes and felt the earth shift beneath her feet, which was weird because she was still sitting down. Then she wasn't sitting anymore, because he pulled her upright and brought her gently into his arms. His second kiss was even better than the first, and immediately all logical thought vanished, leaving only warmth and love behind. Wait love? No. Impossible. She gasped and broke off from his kiss, her heart thundering so loudly in her chest that she couldn't hear anything else. Not the shrieks from the water skiers and boaters, or whatever Jason was saying. I have to go, I have an early shift in the morning. Annie wait. She shook her head, embarrassed beyond belief. I'm sorry, I can't. I just can't. For the first time in her life, she turned her back on the mess, dirty dishes and all, to quickly make her way to her side of the townhouse, closing and locking the patio door behind her. It wasn't until much later that she remembered that she didn't have an early shift the next day, because Monday was her day off. Jason must think she lost her mind. Although better that than to have him realize she'd lost her heart. She closed her eyes, willing the panic away. Her feelings didn't matter. As long as Jason didn't figure it out, she'd be fine. Right? Right. Despite the ridiculously early hour, she climbed into bed and tried to reread her Karen Kingsbury book. But her mind kept wandering. How on earth would she face Jason in the morning? What possible excuse could she use for running out on him like that? If only she could return to her house. But the thought of staying there with the ghosts of Kurt's memory kept her from leaving. 
Besides, she didn't have a car to get to work and back. She tossed and turned most of the night. By six she was bleary-eyed and crabby. Giving up on sleep, she headed into the bathroom to shower and change. The hot water made her feel slightly more human, but she would have given anything for a steaming pot of coffee. After eating another bowl of instant oatmeal, she decided to walk to Rose's cafe. For one thing, she wasn't quite up to seeing Jason, and for another, Josie seemed like someone she could be friends with. The fact that there would be coffee was a definite plus. As she walked, the name of Tommy's friend popped into her mind. Davy Landry. Her steps slowed as she turned the name over in her mind. Hadn't the guy who'd knocked against her elbow in the cafe been Pete Landry? Davy's father? No wonder the guy didn't like her. Maybe the father felt that Tommy had been a bad influence on her son. Annie made a mental note to tell Jason. She resumed walking coming up to the cafe. Even this early on a Monday morning, the place was packed. Josie was there but she wasn't working. Instead, a young woman bustled around taking orders and refilling mugs. Annie found the last empty booth and took a seat, grateful when the waitress wearing a name tag that identified her as Reba immediately came by with a mug of coffee. Apparently not many people in Crystal Lake bothered with tea. Thanks, Annie said with a smile. Reba nodded and moved on. She had maybe two minutes of peace and quiet before Josie came over and slid into the seat across from her. Annie, how are you? She asked. I'm so glad you came by. I was desperate for a cup of coffee, Annie admitted, taking another bracing sip. So you do take the occasional day off, huh? Josie laughed and gestured for Reba to bring her a cup. Yes, of course. Did you think I worked from 5 in the morning till 10 at night seven days straight? Long hours. Josie snorted. You're telling me. Her gaze turned speculative. I hear you're staying next door to Deputy Thomas. Temporarily, she admitted. Although I'm hoping to get my house listed ASAP. Maybe some Packer-hating Bears fan will snatch it up. No. Josie's eyes went wide in mock horror. You can't sell to a Bears fan. They both burst out laughing at the ridiculous rivalry between the Wisconsin diehard Packer fans and the equally stubborn Chicago Bears fans. Sports at its best. Although Annie couldn't care less which team won, she was more of a baseball kind of girl. I heard your car is pretty much totaled, Josie said, turning the conversation to a serious note. If you need help getting around, just let me know. Ridiculous tears pricked her eyes at Josie's kindness. She quickly swiped them away. Thank you. I may take you up on your offer. Anytime. Asking for help wasn't easy, but Annie forced herself to push ahead. If you're not busy this morning, would you be able to give me a ride out to my place? I have to clean up the front door before meeting with the realtor. Sure, I have time for that. I have to run a few errands, but I can do those later. She hated being a burden. No, don't, just drop me off first and I'll clean while you take care of whatever you need. Just swing by to pick me up when you're finished. No rush. I really appreciate the help. Okay, Josie agreed good-naturedly. Are you going to fill me in on the details surrounding Deputy Thomas's kiss? This time, instead of spitting out her coffee, she sighed. I suppose everyone in town caught a glimpse of that, huh? Maybe not everyone, Josie countered. But enough for the news to spread at the speed of light. The cafe owner leaned forward. I know I have a bad reputation, but I won't repeat anything you tell me. I'll respect your privacy. But for the record, Jason hasn't been the same since Darla broke his heart a few years back. I think it's great that you two have found each other. Oh, but we haven't really? Her voice trailed off when she realized Josie had gotten distracted by someone standing behind her. Reba, please put Annie's coffee on my tab, Josie called out. Unless you want more, Annie? No, I'm fine. Great, let's get out of here. Josie led her out of the cafe through the back where she had a car parked. It was a Honda Civic in good condition, and Annie slid into the passenger seat, grateful for an excuse to put off seeing Jason. 
at least the news of their second kiss hadn't made the rounds. Yet. Josie chatted about various business owners and local gossip as she drove out to what the entire town thought of as the Hinkle Place. Since the Honda sat low to the ground and the driveway was rutted with dirt and gravel, Annie put a hand on Josie's arm. This is close enough, I don't want you to damage your car. Are you sure? When Annie nodded, Josie shrugged. Okay. But take my cell number in case you want to be picked up early. Annie took her small prepaid cell phone from her purse and entered Josie's number. Thanks but as I said there's no rush. I'll hang out until you're ready. Sounds good. Catch up with you later. Annie slid out of the passenger seat and then waved at Josie as she drove away. She turned and walked up the driveway to the house, relieved to see that there wasn't any additional graffiti, at least not on the side facing the road. Using her key she unlocked the front door and stepped inside. The interior looked exactly the way she'd left it. Annie set her purse on the counter, then filled up a bucket with warm soapy water. She'd tackle the front door first, hoping the red spray paint would come off. If it didn't she'd need to refinish the entire oak door, a task she wasn't thrilled about. When she stepped back outside, she smiled when she caught a glimpse of a white-tailed deer. A doe who looked up at her, then wandered leisurely away in search of food. Annie scrubbed at the door, and after what seemed like forever, but was probably only 15 minutes, the paint slowly washed away. Putting more elbow grease into it, she scoured and scrubbed until every last trace of the death threat was gone. There, she said in satisfaction. That's much better. You think so? The sound of a female voice had her spinning around in surprise, she hadn't heard anyone approach. When she saw Bridget Walsh standing there, she went completely still. Especially when she saw the small gun in her hand. You should have left when you had the chance, Bridget said, her tone flat and hard. Annie didn't respond, her gaze searching for Carly. The child wasn't in the immediate area, but surely Bridget hadn't left the girl home alone. And how had Bridget known where to find her? I'm sorry for whatever I did to make you so angry, Annie said, trying not to panic. Her purse and her phone were inside the house, and Josie wouldn't be back for hours. Even worse, Jason didn't know where she was either. Why hadn't she listened to him about the potential danger? Stop lying, you know exactly why I hate you. Bridget's voice was harsh and her eyes narrowed with loathing. You killed him. Annie was at a complete loss as to what this crazy woman was talking about. Killed who? My Kurt. Carly's father. Bridget's gun hand began to shake, but she kept the muzzle pointed directly at Annie. It's your fault our daughter will grow up without a father. 8. Jason regretted putting Annie on the defensive, and as a result, he didn't sleep well. Early the following morning, he was still trying to figure out a way to make amends. He didn't think she was afraid of him, the way she'd feared her former husband, but that didn't mean she wanted him making advances, either. After he finished making breakfast, he walked over to knock on Annie's door. No answer. Hum. He told himself to walk away, but he couldn't do it. Instead, he peered through the unbroken side of the patio door. There was no sign of her anywhere. He did his best to squelch the flutter of panic. Annie was an adult. She could still be sleeping. Or she could have gone for a walk. Either way, she obviously hadn't been in the mood for company. Especially his. Instantly his appetite vanished, but he returned to his kitchen and forced himself to eat. Just as he was finishing up, his phone rang. Jace? It's Dev. I completed the background checks on Tommy's friends and believe it or not, none of them live in the area anymore. He frowned. Seriously? Yep. One moved to Minnesota, the other to Milwaukee, and the last one died in a tragic overdose of booze and pills. Oh, and I found out that Pete Landry's son Davey used to be friends with Tommy, but he actually has a good job in Madison. Bottom line? I don't think any of these are viable suspects. I'll still check with the corrections facility, but these names are a dead end. Great just great. Davy Landry being Pete's son might explain the man's rudeness, 
but they were no closer to finding the perp than they were yesterday. Thanks, Dev. I'll let Annie know as soon as I see her. I just caught a glimpse of her leaving Rose's cafe with Josie. Guess they must be heading out on some sort of shopping spree or something. Shopping? That didn't sound like Annie. Although maybe she went along with Josie to keep her company. Strange, as he didn't think Josie and Annie were close. Yeah, well, I'm sure I'll run into her sooner or later. I should hope so, considering she's staying right next door, his buddy said in a dry tone. Thanks, Dev. Jason set his phone aside and began washing his dishes, mentally figuring out what he needed to accomplish on his day off. When he finished, he began making phone calls. The hour was still pretty early, so he was forced to leave a message with both his insurance company about the damaged patio door and with Suzanne White, the real estate agent, about listing Annie's house. Thinking of the place, he realized they'd never cleaned up the vandalism painted on her front door. Since that was something he could easily do for her, he quickly showered and changed, then tossed a bucket and rags in the trunk of his car. With any luck, he could have the mess cleaned up before Annie returned from her shopping trip. As he drove to Annie's cabin, he thought about who could possibly be responsible for the threat, throwing the rock at her windshield and tossing a brick through the patio door. He passed the spot where Annie's car had hit the tree, and made a mental note to check with Henry, the owner of Billy's garage, to see how bad the damage was. There was a car parked on the side of the road, just past Annie's driveway. He frowned and pulled in behind it. He knew Josie's vehicle, and this wasn't it. He walked up to the driver's side window, and immediately heard the sound of crying. What in the world? There, in the back seat, was a little girl sobbing hysterically. The windows were all rolled up, which was the first problem. The sun wasn't very high in the sky yet, but that didn't mean the temperature inside the vehicle wasn't too warm for a child. He tested the door handle and wasn't surprised when it was locked. He debated breaking into the car to get the child, but then it occurred to him where he'd seen the little girl before. The child's mother had been the one who'd rudely told Annie to stay away from them outside the ice cream parlor. The earlier panic returned with a vengeance. Had the child's mother spray-painted the threat? He called the dispatcher at the sheriff's department and requested assistance. Wishing he had his weapon, he circled the car and silently crept up the driveway. After a few feet, he could hear the sound of voices. The child's mother certainly, but who else? An accomplice? Someone to assist in doing more damage to Annie's house? Stepping carefully, he inched forward, then took refuge behind a large tree. The voices were louder now, and his stomach dropped to the soles of his feet when he recognized Annie's voice. I'm sorry about Kurt's death, but it wasn't my fault. I wasn't even here when it happened, I was already on my way to Madison. It is your fault. You upset Kurt by trying to leave him. You should have waited. You didn't even give me time to tell him about my pregnancy. All I needed was a little more time. I'm sorry, Annie said, her voice calm and soothing. I didn't know anything about you and Kurt. Liar! Bridget screamed. You were jealous, and that's why you left the way you did, upsetting Kurt so that he went a little crazy. Jason's heart lodged in his throat as he considered his options, which were admittedly limited without a weapon. He took another step closer, sweeping his gaze over the area for something he could use. There. A tree branch that appeared to have been broken off during a recent storm. He carefully crossed over and picked it up, grateful to find it was reasonably solid. Now all he had to do was to get close enough to disarm Bridget. Or to stall long enough for his backup to arrive. Please, Lord give me the strength and wisdom to save Annie. Bridget don't do this, Annie said. You have to think about Carly, now. If you're caught, you'll go to jail, and then what will happen? Your little girl will end up in foster care. No she won't, because I'm not going to get caught. You're here alone, by the time your body is found me and Carly will be long gone. You're underestimating the authorities here. Deputy Thomas is already investigating your acts of vandalism, Annie pointed out. Throwing the brick through his patio door was a big mistake. He owns that townhouse, and he isn't going to rest until he knows who's responsible for the damage. Doesn't matter, 
he won't be able to prove anything. Now move away from the door. Jason tightened his grip on the branch, taking silent steps forward as they continued talking. He could only see the back of Bridget. Still, he had to assume she had some sort of weapon pointed at Annie. Annie lifted her hands up in a gesture of surrender as she moved away from the cabin, over to the open area along the side of the house. He didn't think Annie knew he was there but suddenly her gaze clashed with his, and even from this distance he could see the flash of relief in her gaze. He lifted a finger to his lips, encouraging her not to give him away. Keep going, Bridget said. I need you to be far enough from the house to avoid blood splatter. Where's Carly? Annie asked as she took another step sideways. You didn't leave her home alone, did you? My daughter is none of your business, Bridget snapped. Jason knew he was running out of time, the minute Bridget had a clear shot she'd take it. Police, he shouted in a stern voice. Drop your weapon. The second Bridget swung around in surprise, he leaped forward and brought the branch crashing down on her gun hand. She shrieked in pain and dropped the gun. Tossing the branch aside, he tackled her, taking her down to the ground. Jason. Annie cried, running forward. Thank goodness you found me. He didn't dare take his eyes off the woman he had pinned beneath him. Sweep the gun out of reach but don't touch it with your hands. Annie used her foot to kick the gun away. Her name is Bridget Walsh, and I'm worried about her daughter, Carly. I don't know where she is. No. Bridget screamed. You can't have my daughter. She's in the car Ms. Walsh left parked out on the highway, he said in a grim tone. Kid's been crying for who knows how long. But I still don't understand why this woman has it out for you. Carly is Kurt's daughter, Annie said. Apparently she blames me for his death. Let me go, let me go. Bridget began sobbing as she struggled against him. My daughter needs me. Her father is dead, she needs me. You should have thought of that before you came out here with a gun, he said. Bridget Walsh, you're under arrest for the attempted murder of Annie Rawson. You have the right to remain silent, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. He continued reciting the Miranda warning, as the sounds of police sirens filled the air. The cavalry had arrived and Bridget Walsh was going directly to jail, where she belonged. Dev walked up the driveway and took over. First he put the gun in an evidence bag, then he slapped a pair of handcuffs around Bridget's wrists and hauled her away. Jason pushed himself upright and crossed over to Annie. He ached to pull her into his arms but after the way she'd run away from him last night, he forced himself to stay back. Are you okay? he asked in a hoarse voice. You're sure she didn't hurt you? Annie swallowed hard and nodded. I'm fine but I… I had no idea Kurt was seeing someone on the side. He winced, wondering what else Annie didn't know about the man she'd married. I'm sorry, Annie. They must have kept their relationship a secret. What's going to happen to that poor little girl if her mother goes to jail? Her ability to care about her husband's illegitimate child was humbling. She'll be okay in foster care, someone will take her in. He curled his fingers into fists to keep from reaching for her. Jason? I need a hug. Annie's voice broke and that was all he needed. They both moved at the same time meeting in the middle. He swept her into his arms, bringing her in close and holding on tight. I'm so glad you're okay, he whispered, pressing his cheek against her hair. If I had been even five minutes later. You were right on time. Her voice was muffled against his shirt. Thank you. Thank you for saving my life. Oh, Annie. He stopped himself just in time, coming too close to blurting out how much he loved her. God was watching over us, she whispered. He couldn't argue, especially since he'd felt God's presence guiding him to Annie. Granted he hadn't realized it at the time, but he was learning. I know. She wrapped her arms around his waist. I shouldn't have come out here alone. You told me I was in danger, but I didn't take it seriously enough. It's my fault I pushed too hard last night. I'd rather cut off my arm than make you uncomfortable. She shook her head, then lifted her chin so she could look up at him. No Jason. You didn't make me uncomfortable. 
I was running away from my feelings. Her feelings? Hope flickered in his chest. My kiss didn't scare you. She smiled, and the flicker of hope burned brighter. No, Jason. But we agreed to be friends and, well, I don't think friends kiss like that. You're right they don't. He reached up to cup her cheek in the palm of his hand. But I have to say, I really like kissing you, so maybe we could ditch the friends idea. Her expression turned uncertain. You don't want to be friends. Oh, Annie. He didn't want to scare her, but at the same time, he didn't want to lose her either. He bent down and lightly brushed her lips with his. I want more than friendship if you'll have me. You deserve someone better, but that doesn't change the fact that I'm falling in love with you. El love. Her eyes widened with surprise. But how? Why? Shish. He kissed her again, taking his time to explore her mouth the way he'd been wanting to do since the first time he saw her standing next to her car with her arms crossed defensively across her chest. After they were both breathless, he lifted his head. You're brave and strong and helped me rediscover God. But there's no pressure, Annie. I'm willing to wait as long as it takes for you to love me back. Or if you can't, he couldn't bear to finish the thought. Annie's smile was tremulous. You won't have to wait long, Jason. Because I think I've fallen in love with you, too. His heart swelled in his chest. Annie, are you sure? You've been through so much. I'm sure. Her voice was strong and firm. Everything I've been through has only helped me to get in touch with my real feelings. I love you, Jason. You deserve someone better than me, but I will always love you. He laughed and lifted her up in his arms, swinging her around in a circle. You're the one who deserves someone better, but I'm not willing to give you up. Not now that you've made me the happiest guy in the world. We deserve each other, Annie said when he set her back on her feet. Don't you remember how I told you to trust in God's plan? This is where he brought us to this point right now. She was right. Once he'd thought it was crazy to think that they'd been heard as part of God's plan, but without their respective pasts they wouldn't be here. Together. I love you, Annie, he repeated, thinking he'd never get tired of saying it. I love you too. She took his hand as they walked back to his car. Let's go home. Home. He liked the sound of that. Epilogue. Four months later. Annie gazed down at Carly, who was sleeping in her toddler bed. She and Jason had gotten married a month ago by Pastor John in a small quiet ceremony. But even before the wedding, they'd worked together to become temporary foster parents for Carly. The little girl deserved a chance at a normal and healthy life. Her mother was still in jail, and there was a lot of talk about whether or not she'd be found competent to stand trial. A knock at the front door had her hurrying over to answer it, before whoever was out there woke Carly from her nap. The little girl's naps were few and far between in the months since she'd been without her mother. She opened the door and froze when she recognized her son, Tommy, standing there. For a long moment she went tense, wondering if he'd come to seek revenge. But then Tommy hung his head as if embarrassed and shuffled his feet. Hi, Mom. His voice was soft, hesitant. As if he half expected her to kick him to the curb. Tommy? Are you out now? He cleared his throat. Yeah, I'm out on parole. I hope you don't mind me stopping by to say hi. She could barely contain her surprise. Hoping he was being sincere and hadn't come to take his anger out on her, she stepped back. Of course not. Please come in. Tommy came inside and she was grateful that Jason was outside tinkering with the used fishing boat he'd recently purchased. She wasn't at all sure how her son would feel about her being married and to the cop who'd killed his father. Um, how did you know where to find me? He flashed a lopsided smile as they made their way into the kitchen. Really? I stopped by Rose's cafe. Josie gave me the whole scoop on everything I've missed. Everything? She faced him straight on, no longer afraid to speak her mind. So you know that Jason and I are married? Yep. Tommy tucked his hands into the front pockets of his jeans and avoided her direct gaze. I'm happy for you. Oh yeah? 
She didn't bother hiding the skepticism in her voice. He surprised her by nodding. Yes? His eyes locked with hers. I'm sorry for everything. I should have been a better son, should have stopped drinking, should have stopped dad from hurting. His voice trailed off. Annie couldn't stand it. No matter what had transpired between them, this was her son and she loved him. She closed the gap between them and threw her arms around him. It's not your fault, Tommy. I have regrets too. But looking backward at everything we could have done differently isn't healthy. We have to move forward. She pulled back so she could look at him. This is the perfect time to start over. Mom? His voice cracked and then he was hugging her again. She heard the patio door open and knew that Jason had come in to make sure she was okay. Annie. Jason's tone held a note of anxiety. Tommy stepped back and she subtly swiped away her tears. Jason, this is my son Tommy. Tommy, this is my husband Jason Thomas. If I had known you were being released, I would have waited. No need. Tommy offered his hand to Jason. Nice to meet you. I hear you've been taking good care of my mom. I hope so, Jason said, glancing at Annie warily. But maybe you'd better ask your mom to be sure. She rolled her eyes. Yes, Jason, of course you make me happy. She turned back toward Tommy. Do you have a place to stay? Her son nodded. Yep. They helped me get a job, and I share a small apartment with another parolee in Madison. It's nothing glamorous, but I'll take it. She nodded, thinking it was good that Tommy wanted to remain independent. Better for both of them. Mommy. Carly's young voice caused everyone to turn toward her. Who's dat? Annie swallowed hard and sent a desperate glance toward Jason. He crossed over and lifted the little girl in his arms, giving her a kiss. Hey kiddo, you didn't nap very long. Don't like naps. Carly rested her head on Jason's shoulder, and just watching the two of them together cemented her belief that Carly belonged with them. Granted it would be a long time before any permanent decisions were made, but that didn't stop her from praying about it every single night. You have a daughter? Tommy asked, clearly confused. Actually, this is Carly. She's your half-sister. Annie steeled herself for a flash of anger. Not mine but your father's daughter. Tommy's face went pale, but he took the news better than she could have hoped. I see. Would you like to join us for dinner? Her husband's offer helped ease the tension. Nice day to grill out. Tommy looked at Carly and Jason, then swung back to face her. I'd like that. The tightness in her chest eased, and in that moment she knew everything would be all right. Their family might not be traditional, but it was still hers. God had answered every one of her prayers after all. Dear Reader Dear Reader I hope you enjoyed Annie's story as much as I loved writing it. From the first moment I introduced Annie in healing her heart, I kept thinking about what had happened to her and how she was doing. So much so, that I felt compelled to write her story. And who better to pair her up with than Deputy Jason Thomas, the man who shot her abusive husband? This is truly a story of love, forgiveness, and believing in the power of God's plan. I love hearing from my readers, so please stop by my website at www.lorascottbooks.com or Facebook at Laura Scott Author. Yours in faith. Laura Scott